confirmed. All guests have been muted. What a huge turnout, folks. Welcome to Johnson Space Center. It's really a lot of fun to see everybody uh, calling into this uh, presentation today because uh, guess what? Uh, the real Martian explorers, well, we're doing Mars exploration here at Johnson Space Center and at NASA, but the real Martians are going to be you folks out there listening to this. You're going to be the ones that are going to be going to Mars. Now, before we get started, I thought I would spend just a few minutes here talking about who I am, uh, what I do, and how I got here. Um, I am currently the chief scientist for the Astromaterials Exploration and uh, Astromaterials uh, Research and Exploration Science Division here at the Johnson Space Center. Now, what does somebody like that do? Uh, my main job is to advise our division, which is quite large. We have about 180 staff scientists here uh, within our division on the types of science we need to be involved in, future directions, what do we do here uh, at the Johnson Space Center and at NASA as we go forward uh, to explore our solar system. Now, I'm also heavily involved in current Mars missions. Uh, and most of you are probably quite familiar with the Curiosity rover, uh, that has been on Mars since August of 2012. Uh, I am heavily involved in that. In, in fact, I am one of the folks that lead daily science tactical operations, uh, actually uh, direct the rover on where we're going to go and what we're going to do. Uh, also have been active in other uh, rovers and landed missions, uh, most particularly uh, another rover on Mars today. Uh, almost for 12 years is the Opportunity rover. Now. Here I am, sitting here in this office, working for NASA. How did I get here? Uh, I was uh, born in Colorado and grew up in a little town out in eastern Colorado. It was a farm and ranch land. Uh, uh, we grew up uh, growing corn and wheat and, and, and basically tending to cattle. Uh, that's where I started. And, but one thing I did do is I got encouragement from my family and my teachers to go on to college, so I did. I went to Colorado State University where I received a bachelor's degree in agronomy, which is the study of soil and plant science, uh, went on to get a master's degree, and then uh, uh, went on to get a uh, doctor's degree uh, in soil science, uh, and particularly in soil mineralogy at Texas A&M University. Now, that's been a lot of years ago. It's been almost uh, 30 years ago now that I have graduated from uh, university but how do I get to where I am today? Well, maybe it's a little bit of luck. Uh, things uh, happened pretty uh, nicely for me over the years. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it was a lot of hard work. Uh, I had to, to do a lot of uh, activities, uh, maybe a little bit after our work, uh, learn things that I didn't know uh, to stay up on what was the current uh, uh, environment as far as uh, NASA projects go. So, but uh, it just seemed to fall in that one day uh, I found myself, uh, actually uh, I wasn't driving rovers on Mars, but hey, someone has to do it, why not me? So since about uh, 2004, I have been uh, directing the science activities that we do uh, on Mars from both uh, the uh, Opportunity and Spirit rover, the Phoenix Lander that landed uh, near the northern polar regions of Mars, as well as uh, the Curiosity uh, rover. And those missions are changing the way we look at Mars. Now, NASA has a major goal, and that goal is to uh, look and search for a potential of past life, either um, life that might have developed there uh, maybe uh, several billion years ago, and possibly life there today, and of course, really important is the search for uh, liquid water. Now there are other robotic missions that I mentioned just previously here that uh, are currently uh, at Mars. Uh, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter is taking pictures uh, from orbit as is uh, Mars Odyssey and I mentioned the Mars Exploration Rover Spirit and Opportunity and the Phoenix Lander. And these missions are really, really shaping the way we look at Mars. Now, I asked the first question. So everybody, who has seen the movie The Martian? I've seen it. So go ahead in the chat window, put your answers in there. I'd like to know how many of you have seen this movie so far. So teachers, maybe you can poll your students and see, give us a little bit of how many of them percentage-wise 
have seen the movie. So Duxbury Senior Center in Massachusetts has seen um, the movie from Dove Elementary. We've got 13 students. Cannon, about half the class. Mernon, about five students. Leon Springs, someone has read the book. Uh, from Shelley Elementary, we've got some folks that have seen the movie as well as Harmony Hills, Evergreen, Cannon Elementary, and some other groups. It looks like we have about 50% or a handful of some of the uh, groups that have seen the movie. So, uh, so Doug has seen the movie. I have not, so we're 50% here as well. The Rice School, a couple of people have seen it. And again, others have read the book as well, which is great. So, Doug, you've got some people out there that have seen it. Cool. I love to hear that. Uh, I, I found the movie a lot of fun, and I've been asked a number of times on was the movie fact or fiction. And for the most part, it is fact. Now, uh, there was one part in that, I hate, I'm not going to ruin it for you all, but uh, there's a big, huge dust storm that comes up. And that dust storm might have been pushing the limits of scientific reality just a bit. But that's what they do in the movies sometimes. But other than that, it was pretty factual as far as uh, what was depicted in the movie. Okay, now, next question. Uh, what would you need to live or survive on Mars? So again, in the chat window, here's where we want to get your perspectives. What do you and your students think you need to live or survive on Mars? And let's see what types of answers we get from some of the groups that are uh, there. I'll stand by and wait for some answers to come in. So Maple Hill says air, water, food. Harmony Hills, air, food, water, shelter. Rice pool, oxygen, food, water, air, seeds, water, oxygen. Someone has said duct tape. We might use <laughs> duct tape. Uh, good climate. Um, Shelter and food, let's see, Duxbury is mentioning food, water, oxygen, normal uh, temperatures, protection from radiation. The Rice School is saying maybe a suit. Mother Teresa Catholic School is indicating some food like potatoes, mushrooms, and non-perishable foods. Someone there in Lincoln likes bacon, so they want bacon uh, as some of their food. A freezer, possibly. A way to travel around has come in from Park View. Uh, Wataga Middle School is saying good climate, soil, water, oxygen, and Parkview is also added in their communication. So you've got a wide variety of answers there, Doug, and, and Becknarsic Junior High School also added in lots of warmth and a source of light. we got some smart cookies out there. Well, uh, I'll say we do. In fact, uh, pretty much uh, you folks have nailed what I call the basics. Uh, although I did forget one, uh, and that was the duct tape. And I agree with you, if I was going to go on, on a venture out there, I think I'd take some duct tape with me because you never know when you might need to piece something together. But you got it. You got the main ones. You have to have water. You have to have breathable air. You have to have food. You have to have the shelter. And, of course, you have to have that power to keep you warm and to give you light. So you nailed the main ones. So this group has got it under control. Now, what I want to do now is turn to what NASA is doing to address these kinds of uh, issues that we would encounter when we go to Mars. Uh, we call it the Regenerative Life Support Program, uh, and sometimes we refer to the Exploration Life Support Program. The major areas are many of the ones that you have just defined, air revitalization, wastewater reclamation, food production, solid waste treatment, which nobody said, but that's something we will have to develop. And the other one is at what we call atmospheric control of taste, trace contaminants. Now, why is that important? Because we're going to be in a small tin can. And if you could imagine something outgassing and you weren't able to take care of that uh, potentially toxic uh, trace gas, uh, it could cause some serious uh, harm to us uh, when we're on one of these missions. So we have to take that very seriously. So what we want to do in these systems is we want to try to recreate what good old Mother Earth does for us, and we want to try to do that inside of a tin can. Uh, this is just an artist's rendition of what a base might look like on the moon or on Mars, and what we want to try to do is try to create the things that good old biological systems do here on Earth for us uh, as humans. Now, everybody knows this cycle. I'm almost certain that all your teachers and you've all talked about this many times, 
is that here on Earth, uh, we breathe out uh, a gas called carbon dioxide. Uh, that carbon dioxide is very essential for plants. That's what they utilize in order to uh, do photosynthesis, which is taking the light from the sun and processing that uh, through their leaves such that they can get this, their, their biomass and grow on, on the surface. So we eat the plants. That's our food source. Uh, we reprocess all the waste. And what we would do in this tin can is basically try to recycle everything that is in there. Now, I've had the unique privilege uh, and honor uh, a number of years ago to actually live inside of one of these cans uh, here at the Johnson Space Center. And in these cans, we were testing life support systems that we were using on space stations at the time, but also ones that we would use on the moon and on Mars. Now, we have uh, a chamber that has three levels. Uh, uh, it wasn't very large, but it was large enough for four of us at a time to be inside this tin can. Uh, we had another chamber where we actually grew plants, and that would provide the oxygen for the crew, and the crew, of course, would breathe out CO2, and that CO2 would be used for those plants. Now, inside this can, we had a lot of different activities. Uh, here we are in this really tight, closed environment. That means we tried to make sure nothing was going out of the system and nothing was coming into the system except for power. And in this case, we had uh, maybe a little bit of leakage of our atmosphere uh, because almost every system we have within NASA will have a small amount of leakage. It's really difficult not to do that. But we were, ex where we were constantly monitoring the atmosphere to make sure there were no trace gases that might be uh, potentially toxic to us. Uh, we were swabbing the uh, surfaces to make sure there was no microbial growth. Uh, and then we did a lot of fun things, too. And, and one of the things we did was uh, exercise. I actually ran a lot while I was inside the can, and that's me running on the left here uh, inside the chamber, uh, where I actually one day, I think, uh, for a controlled environment uh, 10 uh, uh, K, I think I probably got the world's record. Probably I'm the only person that's ever run 10 K inside of a tin can, though. But we did our all of our own cooking, uh, sample preparation, and our recreation. We also had a, uh, a TV. We could actually watch some uh, uh, recreational TV, but many of the time we were watching our systems on our uh, control panel systems. And we had some pretty uh, modest facilities uh, that you need in order to live. We actually washed our own laundry inside. Uh, we had uh, system monitoring showers, uh, all the kinds of things you have to have if you're inside a small tin can. So when you're designing uh, an outpost on Mars, you're going to have to consider these things. And that's absolutely most, one of some of the most important parts and elements of actually existing and living on Mars. Now, there were some uh, real memorable moments. Uh, one of them is recycled water. Now, uh, one thing, I'm not going to ask you all this, but just stop and think about this. Uh, we recycled all of our human waste uh, urine in this system, and it went through the entire uh, repolishing uh, reclamation system, and we consumed that uh, water. So what, could you do that? Uh, and I will tell you this, that our water was purer than any of the water you are drinking in your municipal water systems, and guess what? The municipal water systems are almost all recycled water from, from somewhere upstream. So uh, this is really important uh, a concept that uh, the travelers going to Mars will just have to accept that. You have to do uh, regeneration and recycling. Now, one other thing, I love to fly fish. I spend quite a bit of time uh, fly fishing in the Rocky Mountains. And so one of the things we did for <laughs> a little bit of entertainment was what I called fly fishing in a can. Now, the the success of these tests was due to fantastic teamwork. Uh, we had engineers, scientists, uh, we had computer scientists, we had a whole uh, bunch of different folks from different fields working together to make this successful. So teamwork is incredibly important in the success of uh, getting us on the surface of Mars. Okay, now. Uh, what do you think would be the biggest challenge for humans living and working on Mars? So go ahead in your chat window and place down there some of those. And many of you have already stated these when we asked earlier, uh, what would you need to live on Mars? But go ahead, let's do this again. And think about what Doug has just talked about within in the can himself and other things. 
uh, that you might consider challenges. And some groups have already actually talked about gravity, staying alive, radiation. West Hill High School says growing food in the water supply. Uh, Evergreen has mentioned about working together and how that would be potentially a challenge, but an important one to address. Uh, Shelley Elementary and Mr. Engel's class is missing family, the dust storm issue, air. Uh, Leon Springs is talking about mobility and the lack maybe of mobility. Wataga Middle School has said, you know, the atmosphere and growing plants, that's a challenge. Union Township is saying working with a suit on could be a challenge. Uh, Mernon Elementary mentions about the whole issue of medicine and what if you do need medicine um, and temperature regulation. Uh, another group from Evergreen is mentioning sustainable air and really kind of learning a new way to live. Uh, Cannon Elementary brings up an interesting point of continuing contact with Earth and Shaker Heights mentions even maintaining oxygen levels, recycling water, cooling and heating, worrying about running out of water is another concern as well as taking care of someone who might get sick. That came from the Rice School here in Texas. And others have mentioned getting supplies, avoiding flying debris, bad weather, uh, temperature, electricity, radiation, uh, engineering tools you might need, um, maintaining body temperature. Here's an interesting one. Close living quarters from Cannon Elementary, and that could be a challenge, as well as Rice School mentions reading a compass, and can you even do that on Mars? Uh, and last but not least, and there are others that I'm sure I have missed, Mernon Elementary brings up what about maybe unknown diseases? So Doug, a lot of challenges, what do you think? Well, I think that, uh, uh, Paige, uh, we need to hire a bunch of these folks down here and get us to Mars because they've I got to figure so. it out. I think so. Great job. Uh, that is the fastest I've ever seen almost all the issues that NASA is dealing with be put on the table. That was exactly. Incredible. That was really neat. So, but I did hear one that I love. Uh, I'm a soil scientist. Uh, I have an uh, agricultural background. So one of the key questions is, can we grow plants on Mars? And, uh, okay, so here's a spoiler uh, for you guys that uh, uh, all have not seen Marsh in the movie. But uh, one of the key plots in the movie is uh, our astronaut on Mars, uh, astronaut Wat Watley, uh, growing potatoes in Martian soil. And I've had many people, uh, both in the press and uh, other science colleagues, uh, call me up or send me an email and ask me, can we really do this? And the answer is, and I've been thinking about this for a lot of years, is I absolutely think we can. So I think the movie had it right on. We bring material into a closed environment. Now, you can't do this on the surface. You do it in a closed environment. Then you plant your plants in there. Now, the key thing is, is we might need to add a little bit of fertilizer. Uh, and that is something that we will have to think about and probably do a little more research with. But I'm going to stop here, and this is another chat one. I'm going to ask you, this, this is going to be a little more, uh, in, uh, little more difficult to do, but I'm going to ask you, uh, there are 16 elements that are essential for plant growth. Do you know what those 16 elements are? Let us know. So in that chat window, there are 16 elements essential for plant growth. We have Cardinal Gibbons High School says carbon, but NAR6 says carbon dioxide. Leon Springs says oxygen and water. Union Township says water. The Rice School, water, sun, soil. Union Township, CO2. Ukiah, nitrogen, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. NPK, H2O, iron, light. Water fertilizer, CO2, nutrients, magnesium, that NAR6 says, oxygen, sun, phosphorus comes in from Lincoln Avenue School. Evergreen says carbon and nitrogen. Duxbury mentions phosphorus. West Hill High School says water, oxygen, sunlight, nitrogen, hydrogen, magnesium. Lincoln School adds in potassium. Others are adding in calcium, sulfur. Cannon Elementary says water, heat, CO2, oxygen, soil, nutrients, fertilizer. And we have boron, sulfur, and potentially copper and iron. 
Wow, did we get any of them, Doug? Holy cow, you got almost all of them, and boy, uh, superstars, the ones that got uh, uh, copper and boron. Uh, that's pretty pretty neat that you uh, recognize those as being plant essential elements. So let's, let's look at them. Let's go look at what those elements are, and most of you got the majority of them. That is fantastic. Uh, there are the major elements that come from the water and from the atmosphere, and those are uh, oxygen, carbon, and hydrogen. Uh, now, there are the, what we call the, the more primary nutrients, and you got those, nitrogen, phos, uh, phosphorus, and potassium. Uh, those are the ones that uh, MPK I saw. If you go to a fertilizer store or to a horticultural uh, store and you buy fertilizer, there's a little NPK, and it gives you the ratio of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in that fertilizer. Uh, I saw sulfur. I saw iron, man uh, manganese. I saw copper, I saw boron. Probably the only ones that I missed were uh, potentially uh, molybdenum and chlorine, and those are used in such minute amounts, but yet they are essential for plants. So well done, you got almost every one of those. That's great. Now, I will say that as far as uh, the lunar material, or the Martian materials, all of these elements are available on the surface, however, uh, the nitrogen levels that we have measured in the soils on Mars through the rovers is probably not enough. So that is one area that we might have to add uh, nitrogen. And those that you saw the movie uh, The Martian, you know how he did that, right? So I won't spoil it. Those of you uh, that saw the movie knows how he got his nitrogen and some of his fertilizer for his potatoes. Those of you who haven't seen the movie, well, you're going to have to wait to see what that is. But I think you can probably guess. Okay, now, water was really key, and the one question is, where will we get all the water? So uh, in this next question, uh, go ahead and throw into the chat window, where might we uh, find water on Mars? Because it's almost certainly likely that we'll have to, probably can't take it all with us, we'll probably have to be able to uh, extract some water from somewhere on Mars. Where can we do that? So go ahead. All right, so we have some answers coming in. Rice School is saying digging deep holes. Harmony Hill says underground. Lincoln Avenue School says polar caps, ice caps, ice under the dirt, uh, drilling underground, aquifers, glaciers, the atmosphere, the North Polar Cap. Recurring slope lineae comes from Cardinal Gibbons High School. Uh, polar caps, recycling human waste, being buried underneath the surface, underground ice, fog, filtered urine, polar ice caps, uh, changing the atmosphere to potentially make rain. Cannon Elementary includes in rivers potentially or the air. Fog, polar caps, dig for it. Mother Teresa Catholic School mentions about possible geysers, if that's something that exists, and even condensation. But the Wright School mentions but it looks like a desert. So any of these answers possibilities, Doug? Yeah, I think we got some of them there. And I think the recurring slope linear, uh, someone's been looking and doing some research here lately. That's pretty cool. Absolutely. But if you look at this, Mars is really dry on the surface today. Uh, today's Mars is really, really dry. And this is an image, in fact, from our good old uh, rover Curiosity looking off towards the rim of uh, Gale Crater, uh, and it's not very wet out there, but uh, I'm going to talk about where we might find some water next. Now, before I do that, just a few Mars facts. Uh, temperatures on Mars vary drastically. Uh, can be as low as uh, minus 225 degrees Fahrenheit at the poles uh, during the winter months and as high as uh, room temperature where you probably are sitting today, it's probably about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And at the equator on a summer afternoon, that's how hot it gets. So that's not too uh, uncomfortable. But the swings can be incredible from daytime to nighttime where you might see uh, temperature swings as 150 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, which is a whole lot of temperature swing. Uh, now the atmosphere on Mars. It's only 7 millibar pressure. Here on Earth, uh, we have about 760 millibar pressure. So the atmosphere on Mars is only 1% as thick as it is here on Earth. So that is an issue. Uh, 
uh, really low pressure. And the major gas, unlike here on Earth, which is nitrogen, the major gas on Mars is carbon dioxide, and it makes up about 95% of the atmosphere. Now, due to these extreme conditions, the temperatures uh, uh, being what they are, and the atmosphere being really, really small, water is just not very stable at the surface of Mars, it, particularly liquid water. And so I'm going to talk about that in the next couple slides. Now, some facts. You know, if you, people say that, oh, there, if, there, if there's fact or fiction, there's water on Mars, folks, I'll tell you right now, I've been studying this planet for a long time, there is water on Mars. There's water at the polar caps uh, the, that's minus 225 degrees C there, or Fahrenheit there, so you can well imagine that any water vapor that gets in contact with those cold things at the poles will actually freeze out on the surface, particularly if it's in the atmosphere. And also, we landed about 65 degrees northern latitude with the Phoenix lander. Uh, the Phoenix, uh, as it was landing, uh, its retros were blasting out some of the overlying soil. And when we landed, we looked under the spacecraft with our robotic arm camera, and lo and behold, there were slabs of ice. So just a few uh, inches under the surface, uh, we found this layer, with, it's, it's either an ice layer or what we call in some of the polar regions here on Earth, permafrost, a permanently frozen layer of water. So that is liquid water, that is water that could be extracted and used uh, if we had the opportunity uh, to uh, be in this area. Now another thing is we know there's been a lot of evidence of flowing water in the past. Uh, this particular image is, shows this sinuous looking uh, valley, uh, Ma'adim Valleys, which is flowing into a crater, in this case Gusev Crater, that we think at one time was an ancient lake on Mars. So there's a lot of evidence that past Mars had quite a bit of water running on it. Okay, now we know there was water on Mars because I just showed you uh, current uh, images that show there's water, but we just don't know how much water was there in the past and where did it all go. Why aren't we seeing large ice, field, uh, ice sheets uh, somewhere on the, the polar regions, a lot more than what we're seeing today, or subsurface water? Why are we not seeing a whole lot of this? Uh, but we do think that uh, sometime about 3.9 billion years ago, uh, there was a much denser atmosphere, uh, liquid water was actually stable on the surface, and then something drastic happened. Maybe it was a monstrous greenhouse effect. We think a lot of the water actually escaped into space. So hydrogen and oxygen escaping off the surface, and mainly the hydrogen going off into space. And we have evidence from isotope work, and I won't get into the details of this, that suggests that that is what has happened. So one of the things we have just done with the Curiosity rover, and we just published this, I believe, last week in the journal, uh, in one of our uh, scientific journals, was uh, we have evidence of what appear to be these uh, layered sediments. And these uh, have these layers that are very fine. Uh, they're all uh, uh, dipping towards uh, the central mound in Gale Crater, which we call Mount Sharp. And they're all dipping towards that area in the same slope uh, towards the mountain. And we hypothesized that this was deposited by water, water running off of the rims of the crater, coming down into this crater and forming uh, probably what we call uh, an intermittent uh, river lake system. So uh, these sediments were flowing down into the lake. And these are the bottom of the lake, actually, that you see here uh, in this particular photo. Now, you folks out there talking about recurring slope linea, uh, you get an A-plus for the day. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, NASA and some of our scientists that work with NASA announced these things we call recurring slope linea. And what they are is that, that these are features that appear to be flowing down, in this case that you see here, the rim of a crater, flowing down the rim of the crater, and they occur seasonally. They occur when it warms up, and they occur on certain slopes. And uh, just more, most recently, one of our uh, orbiters, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, has a 
a camera on it that takes uh, different uh, regions of the light spectrum. In this case, we were looking at the near infrared region, and they were able to see that this was uh, due to a salt, uh, and the salt in this case is a uh, perchlorate salt, and it's and their hypothesis is that these are brines. These are liquid brines of, of the salty waters running down the surface here. Now, question. You just heard about how unstable Mars uh, water is. Uh, how in the world could we get, and th on these cold temperatures, how in the world could we get the possibility of liquid brines, water, uh, other words, material moving down this slope in which the water was still in a liquid state? How could we do that? So go ahead in the chat window and give me a few answers. So a tough question, but how could this be water flowing down these slopes? So let's see if we have any of these very smart groups that can uh, give us any possible answers. And I'm going to stand by and wait. Now, the Rice School is mentioning um, that it does look like a waterfall, but how could, what would make this be a potential for water actually on the surface? And, and I'll, I'll give you uh, a hint. Well, I don't have to give you a hint. Somebody's already got it. Yeah, Duxbury mentions the melting point of the brine must fall in the rain. Shelley Elementary, Mr. Ingalls' class, says salt water freezes at lower temperatures. Watauga Middle School, salt keeps it from evaporating or from freezing. Moving, uh, wind moving the water is a possibility from Dove Elementary. The ice has been covered by dust on Mars, comes from Bednarsik Junior High. Salt water freezes at different temperatures from Maple Hill. Even Lincoln Avenue School says uh, at night it could get so cold the water would act potentially differently. Um, so we have some uh, layers, landslides, mountain water vapor could be under the surface. And again, from Cannon Elementary, the salt lowers the freezing temperature. Wow, Doug. Yeah. Well, uh, I, you, you all got it. Uh, you got the two major ones. Uh, well done again. And uh, so the, the main thing is is that salt lowers the freezing temperature of water. And you can do this at home. Take a bunch of salt, uh, throw it in a, a, a some place that you can control the temperature and put it in at the uh, uh, good old freezing temperatures. And I'm going to use Celsius because I'm a scientist, zero degrees C and maybe go down to 10 if you can do that, and 20, and just put different amounts of salt in it and see what it does. You'll be surprised on uh, what you can do. Now, the salt that the scientists found on Mars is a particular one called a perchlorate salt. Most of the table salt we have uh, on your tables at home is uh, sodium chloride or maybe you use potassium chloride, but those are chlorides, and this is a perchlorate. It's a slightly different type of chlorine compound. And it can depress the freezing point of water minus 94 degrees Fahrenheit. That's pretty cold. So the hypothesis is that these are flowing down the surfaces as liquid water brines because of the fact these salts are lowering the freezing point. And the, the temperature here at Mars, when they took these on the surfaces, they predict was well above minus 94 degrees Fahrenheit. So that is the theory on how these things have formed. And the other one is, and I heard at least one uh, talk about this, is water's tied up in the soil and rocks. Uh, we have on board Curiosity, uh, an instrument that heats samples up. So we fire the samples with our, our robotic arm, place it into this oven, the oven heats it up, and we see gases coming off like water, carbon dioxide, oxygen, and other gases. And the water isn't huge amounts, but we can simply, uh, every material we've looked at on Mars so far, uh, on Curiosity has at least two weight percent water in it. So we can at least get two weight percent water out of these materials. So uh, you, you've, you've, you folks nailed it. So uh, I won't go into a lot of detail on this, except that uh, you've all pretty much said all of these uh, possibilities. Uh, the only thing, uh, and I think I heard this one too, that I didn't talk about was we could probably extract some out of the atmosphere. I remember one, somebody was talking about potentially condensing it out. Maybe we do that like he does in the movie on a cold plate or something of that nature, but it's, it's quite possible. Okay, so 
here's another chat one. Uh, what else will we need to survive on Mars? And the, uh, uh, is it A, protection from the radiation, B, protection from the Mars environment, C, a production plant for creating resources such as water, D, all of the above? Uh, this will be an easy one. So we'll see what we get, and right away I'm seeing a stream of D and all of the above from just about all the schools that we have on the line, and we've got lots of schools on the line, and they're all in agreement. <laughs> yeah, that was an easy one. Uh, yes. After, this after the last one, uh, this was a little bit easier, but uh, you're right. So now let's, let's talk about those. Now, some of the other ones here. Uh, I heard uh, someone, uh, when I ask about uh, what are some of the uh, key things we'll have to address, radiation. Absolutely. We're going to have to protect ourselves from the radiation. You know, when you go out here in the, on good old Earth and you're in the sunlight, you get UV radiation, you get a little bit of a sunburn. However, on Mars, it doesn't have that atmosphere to protect us as well as the magnetic fields that we have here at Earth. So you actually get a whole lot of radiation from the sun, uh, these sol what we call solar energetic particles. And then you also get these particles coming from deep space, these galactic cosmic rays. And so we're going to have to protect our astronauts from the exposure. So we'll have to have shielding uh, from the radiation. Now. A uh, number of you uh, have talked about uh, protection from the Mars environment already. Uh, I've heard suits and rovers. Uh, and I just put these two up here, just kind of a fun comparison. So those that you haven't seen the Martian uh, probably don't recognize the ones on the left uh, in this view. Uh, but here's our astronaut Wat Watney studying uh, in his suit, uh, contemplating what his next move is going to be to survive on Mars. Uh, and on the right is NASA's current uh, spacesuit that has been designed to use on the surface of Mars. So this is evolving, of course, but NASA is developing these kinds of systems. On the bottom is uh, the uh, rover that uh, Watney drove uh, all over the surface while he was uh, trying to get resources to keep him alive. And on the right is NASA's version of a rover that has been developed. Uh, we call this the multi-purpose mission vehicle. Uh, that can be used on the moon, Mars, and we might even use this uh, in a configuration for weightless environments at an asteroid as well, so that's why it's called multi-mission. Uh, however, this is out in the deserts of, of, of uh, Arizona where we were doing some tests uh, a couple years ago. So you can see we need to have these things to protect us from this, this harsh environment on the surface of Mars. And the other thing uh, is uh, a habitat. I heard a lot of you talking about this. The habitat will absolutely have to have some kind of protection uh, from the radiation environment. Now, you don't need a whole lot. You just need to deflect some of the, primarily the solar uh, radiation, because the galactic rays are so energetic, they may just well go through anything. But at least we can protect ourselves uh, from the solar energetic particles. Uh, on the left is the uh, version of what was found in the Martian. And NASA, here at the Johnson Space Center, is developing the uh, systems that we hope to use on Mars, the habitats we'll use. And it's really important. I heard folks talking about loneliness, uh, tight quarters. Uh, psychologically, you have to do something inside these chambers to keep you mentally uh, alert uh, and, and not get depressed. So our uh, folks here at Johnson Space Center are trying to figure out what's the best way to build these systems to have machines and humans working together in an efficient and also a psychologically pleasing way. So we want these things to look nice. And those of you who saw the Martian will know they had a pretty fancy system. Uh, I don't know if NASA will have quite that fancy, but uh, I hope we get somewhere near that. Now, I talked a little bit about resources, water per se. Uh, I almost am certain during the first few uh, missions on Mars, we will be putting down pilot plants, uh, to see if we can actually extract uh, water, for example, out of the, the soil materials that might be at our landing site, or extracting carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and converting that into oxygen, which could be used for uh, not only human uh, uh, respiration, but could also be used for a propulsion system uh, where we use hydrogen and oxygen propulsion, uh, chemical propulsion to get us off the surface. So we are almost certainly going to develop plants on Mars that will help us utilize the resources.
Okay, so I'm going to kind of just sum up here now. I uh, hope there's a whole lot of things I didn't talk about, and many of you hit on those, and we just don't have time to go into all the specifics, you know, the, the psychological aspects of going to Mars. What do we need to do there? There are so many other things we didn't talk about, but I will tell you what we do need. Uh, we need uh, engineers, scientists, and a whole lot of other folks uh, working together, and it's going to take folks from engineering teams. It's going to take folks from science teams. In fact, uh, uh, there are going to be so many different disciplines that are going to be needed for these human missions. Uh, you think it's everyone's got to be an astronaut, folks. There aren't very many that become astronauts, but there are a lot of engineers, a lot of scientists, there are going to have to be artists, medical doctors, business administrators, technicians. Go, oh, yes, we've got to have the lawyers, too, because we've got to make sure we stay out of trouble. The farmers, got to have the farmers on Mars. Uh, and uh, there's just really a whole bunch of folks got to come together and work together in order to get us to the surface of Mars. But I will tell you this, and I, don't, I, I probably don't need to tell you this, but I will uh, state it anyhow, again, that a solid education is absolutely essential in order to be able to work on this great destination of going to Mars. So I'm going to end here. I'm going to say that uh, one of you folks out there, we plan to send our first crew to Mars around 2035, probably be 2040. Uh, so that's a few years away. And most of you are at the age that will be on that crew. And so the question is, can you be on that crew or can you be involved in developing these systems we are talking about today to help NASA and our nation and planet Earth go to another planet. It's pretty cool to think about that. So awesome. Well, first of all, uh, as uh, Doug, I think, is finished here, I want to thank Doug very, very much for providing such a fantastic presentation. For those of you on the line, you have a special treat being able to hear from Doug. I don't know if you can hear the excitement, and maybe, Doug, as I go through some of these closing remarks, you can go to share, application, and your camera. Um, but for you folks on the line, uh, Doug is such a very busy individual. Just this morning, aside from, if you were on earlier, the training that he was doing, plus commanding a rover on the surface of Mars, uh, he is extremely busy, and for him to be able to share the time with us today and again with the groups tomorrow, we are very, very lucky. So this is now time for Q&A, and um, as Doug is getting ready to share his camera, so it looks like, Doug, I am seeing just the uh, camera view, not you, so maybe you can stop sharing and then go back to the application and select, I don't know if you have two, there we go, now I'm seeing you. Okay. So Doug is actually in his office, and Doug oftentimes spends some time in California doing mission operations, sometimes he's here at the office, he does a lot of traveling around, very busy individual. So Doug, thank you for sharing your presentation with us. And as we get some students putting in questions in the chat window, here's a couple, Doug, that actually came up earlier. Um, one is from the Rice School, and they're here in Texas, and they're wondering what, what happens if someone needs medicine and they're living and working on Mars? How, how, do, how do you prepare for that? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Uh, first of all, when we're going to Mars to start off with, we're gonna have to take everything with us. You know, We're gonna have to take the Advil with us, we're gonna have to take uh, pain medication with us. Uh, we're going to have to just stock up with what might go wrong. Uh, we have had a lot of concern, though, that uh, those of you that have uh, taken medicine know you have to take it by a certain time, uh, a date. You have an uh, expiration date. Now, medicine usually lasts a little longer than that. But can you imagine a 500-day mission to Mars and back? Uh, you have to make sure that all of that medication that you take with you uh, would be able to survive that length of time. Uh, once we get on the surface of Mars uh, with all these phenomenal capabilities we're starting to get here on a good old planet Earth, such as uh, 3D printing and who knows what they can do with that with drugs uh, someday down the road, perhaps we will be able to synthesize or fabricate some of those on the surface. But that's going to take a little time. That's going to be more of an advanced stage on Mars. I think initially, We'll just have to take everything like that with us. 
Excellent. And before I give our second question, we're still having a little bit of a camera issue. Um, so yeah, go to that motion detection and maybe we'll see you. Okay, there you are, you're back. Unfortunately, you can't make that screen any larger, Doug, so that's about as large as that will go. So, okay, great. Okay, excellent. So we can see you again. Um, and now you, you all of a sudden got really small. Um, I'm not sure what setting you just hit, but there you go. You're a little bit bigger now. Okay, so, I'll so, leave it there. I'll leave it there. So Lincoln Avenue School is asking if, if spacesuits are sufficient uh, for protecting the astronauts, and they're from New Jersey, the Lincoln Avenue School. Yeah, the, the suits we are designing here at NASA uh, will maintain an atmosphere inside. Uh, uh, they'll be slightly pressurized, although we're looking at reduced pressure. We're not looking at full uh, one bar or 760 millibar uh, 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 of uh, pressure like we have here on, uh, on the surface. Uh, and they will have to be able to heat up uh, the internal uh, space when the uh, astronaut's in a cold area, uh, cool them down when they're getting blasted by sun, uh, and also the material will have to at least protect them from some of the radiation, particularly the solar radiation. And that shouldn't be a hard thing to do. The suits that NASA has designed uh, right now will do that. So uh, uh, they will be able to protect the uh, crew members from at least the harsh environment for short periods of time. When I say short, uh, uh, hours of time, uh, maybe three or four, maybe five hours of time, or maybe longer than that. It, it, it just it all depends on how much of their uh, resources they put on their back uh, and carry around with them. And it's not like quite on uh, the space station now. So stop and think about the difference here. Uh, space station, when those astronauts go out in those big bulky suits and they've got all their uh, breathable air and their cooling packs to keep them from burning up out there in, in space, no gravity. So there's no weight on them. Uh, well, microgravity, way, wee bit of gravity. Uh, however, on Mars, you've got what kind of gravity? You have one third of what we have here on Earth. So there's going to be definitely some weight. So you've got to make that as light as you can the suit and as mobile as you can so the astronaut can get around and do the job that needs, needs to be get, on, get done, whether setting up the outpost itself or uh, possibly doing geology, which I would like to be doing if I was on the surface, going around and picking up rocks and breaking rocks open and just trying to figure out why this planet is the way it is and how it formed. Awesome. Thank you, Doug. Here's another question from Mother Teresa Catholic School in Florida, and they're wondering how are you going to get enough power? Can you use solar panels? Would that be enough? How, would, talk about this power stuff. Yeah, power is a huge issue. Uh, great question. Uh, solar power is fantastic, and I'm going to use our good old example, opportunity on the surface of Mars today. Uh, opportunity landed uh, back in the early part of 2004. Uh, here we are going into 2015, 2016, the first part of next year. Opportunity will have been on the surface for 12 years using only solar power. That's incredible. You stop and think about that. Uh, the other thing that is really unique is that Opportunity has not lost a much of its power generating capability. It's producing all much, almost as much power now as it did back when it landed. Now, it's not a lot of power, uh, but it does at least work on Mars. So I think we'll use quite a bit of solar power. Uh, it's just been a proven technology on Mars. Uh, we also have what we call uh, radi radioactive thermal generators. Uh, these are our, uh, more, more or less our nuclear type of reactors that we use. We have one of these on board Curiosity. Uh, Curiosity will be able to generate power uh, for years because of the RTG, we call them uh, for short. Uh, that it has on board. Uh, and so that will also probably be part of our uh, power. And not to break uh, y'all's expectations of the movie, but what did old Watney use on Mars while he was there for power? He used two different things. He used solar power and he used what he called the RTG. So uh, those are probably the power sources we'll take with us. Now, uh, I like the solar because you can, if you can sustain those, you can use those uh, indefinitely. You might have to change out panels now and then, but it looks like uh, you wouldn't have to depend upon 
uh, a big nuclear plant, for example, you could actually use solar energy to get a lot of your power. Great question and great answer. And we've got a lot of questions here. So here's the next one from Cardinal Gibbons High School in North Carolina. And they're wondering, um, what would Mars have looked like if it had an atmosphere? Yeah. Well, if it had, it does have an atmosphere. It has, but it's a small percentage of Earth's atmosphere, 1% of Earth's. Uh, I would love to see uh, a one, 100% of uh, what it has now. In other words, the same atmosphere here we have on Earth. Uh, I would guess it would be just like Earth. Uh, it might be a little colder because it's a little further away from uh, Earth, but it's still in what we call, quote, unquote, the Goldilocks zone from the sun. So if we had an atmosphere on Mars, and, it, and there was obviously a lot of water there, probably as much water on Mars at one time as on here on good old Earth, uh, well, proportional to the size of the planets because Mars is a uh, third the size of the Earth. But you can well imagine that if we had that atmosphere on Mars like we have on Earth, we would probably have lakes. We probably would have life there, folks. Uh, that's a tough one to, you know, really say for certainty, but why not? If we had water there, why couldn't life be there? Excellent. So here's an interesting question from Bednarsik Junior High School in Illinois. And they're wondering, what about meat? I mean, do you have to be a vegetarian to be able to live and work on Mars? What about meat? Absolutely a great question. So in the Advanced Life Support Program, we debated this quite a bit. And uh, it's, so you have, if you take animals with you, uh, you have to also have life support systems for the animals. You have to feed the animals. You, so here you've got another component. So that really complicates it all. However, uh, I'm just saying this kind of uh, tongue-in-cheek now, uh, I always have advocated that we take a goat with us because a goat will eat anything, right? So if you have any kind of waste you want to get rid of, you feed it to the goat. Uh, no, I'm not saying we do that. But uh, the, the, it's something we have considered, uh, but the issues with having life support systems for them is – uh, equally hard to do. Now, that doesn't say we won't. Uh, one of the areas that we have actually done work in is is in fish culture. Uh, many years ago, NASA did some work on that. Uh, so we could potentially have fish involved uh, in our uh, life support systems. They're easier to take care of uh, as far as uh, small controlled environments go. Well, we'll see if Doug gets to plan what and who and what kind of food products go to Mars. That sounds very interesting. Love that answer, Doug. Hey, here's another question from Shelley School and Mrs. Rick's class, and they're in Utah. And they're wondering how many people would be landing in this first maybe human mission to Mars? Yeah, uh, it, that's still under debate. Uh, right now the numbers are probably four. For the first missions, probably four folks. Uh, four go. Uh, hopefully all four of them get to land on the surface of Mars and get to spend a little time there. Uh, but I would anticipate that, just like the space station, uh, we've evolved to where we have more crew member on board than when we first started. So I would think we would go from four, maybe have uh, even a point in time where we set up a kind of a permanent outpost where it could grow and could grow to – Five, ten, and I've always advocated that that's the way you start off, and eventually you can have "quote unquote" a colony on Mars. And actually, somebody has actually asked one of the groups. Let's see if I can find this uh, this question here um, from the also actually from the Shelley School and Miss Rick. How how would these habitats be built on Mars? And and also, from Cannon Elementary, how long do you think someone could actually survive on Mars and in these habitats? Yeah, uh, both, both great questions. Uh, a couple days ago, uh, and I think this was kind of a, a neat thing NASA did, they had a competition uh, on 3D printing on Mars for habitats. And if you go online and search in the last week uh, uh, for NASA Mars habitats 3D printing, you'll see the three – uh, different uh, uh, winners that were picked by NASA. Uh, so who knows, maybe we can use 3D printing on Mars. Uh, I would anticipate when we first start out, uh, we will take all of our small habitats with us. When I say small, uh, uh, we can land about uh, 20 to 40 metric tons on the surface of Mars. That's pretty 
that's a lot of weight. Uh, but at the same time, uh, that's not a really large uh, facility. And we'll just have to land one here. Uh, we'll try to land another one here. We'll probably have the capabilities to be able to pick it up with a rover or some kind of. We actually NASA actually has a uh, a system that's called the Athlete that we have developed that would actually take uh, one of the habitats over and hook it up with another habitat. So we could start landing these somewhere, bring them over, and start building our infrastructure. Uh, so that would be the way we would start building our infrastructure, but then maybe evolve to doing things like 3D printing of habitats on the surface of Mars. Uh, and as far as how long we can actually survive, it depends upon how self-reliant we make them. If we make everything reliant from Earth, meaning that we supply everything from Earth, uh, you can live there as long as your supplies are there. Now, if, though, we develop the capabilities to do regenerative life support systems that we talked about in this presentation, and you can create uh, and regenerate uh, new atmospheres, water, produce your food, then you start looking at long duration and maybe even self-reliancy. And if you can extract uh, useful materials from the surface, such as water, uh, take oxygen out of the air, uh, then you get the capabilities to be maybe totally self-dependent from Earth. Now, one question that somebody asked about uh, medicine, uh, those are key questions we'll have to really address. How do we deal if there is a truly a serious illness on Mars? And I know that somebody said that communications is an issue in one of the chats, uh, and it is. Uh, Mars is anywhere from 42 million to 227 million miles away from Earth. And when it's 227 million miles away from Earth, it takes quite a bit of time for our voice messages to reach those crew members. So you can well imagine uh, if we have a 15, 20 minute delay uh, and somebody is sick on the surface and you're trying to maybe do uh, some kind of a telemedicine where you're doing operation uh, on somebody, let's say they got an appendicitis, and you're trying to do that from Earth can you imagine how difficult that might be? Uh, so hopefully we'll develop the systems, and we've been looking at this, that we can do a lot of this uh, through automation. Uh, we can develop the, the surgical procedures that could go in and do this without having to have somebody, either uh, somebody that is an expert on uh, that type of surgery on the surface of Mars, or at least do that from uh, some kind of, of automation here uh, from Earth. Wow, sounds like a big challenge, but one that I know NASA's been working on and that uh, they will certainly have some uh, good ways to be able to mitigate any issues by the time we are sending humans off to Mars to live and work. Now, it is the top of the hour, Doug. I, I know I have still quite a few questions that have come in, but time constraints for you, are you able to stay on for any additional time or must we? I could, I could, I could stay on a little bit longer. Okay, so for those groups, that is the top of the hour. If you do have to leave, um, we so appreciate your time in joining us today. We so hope that you got a lot out of hearing from Dr. Doug Bing today. Uh, and if you had any questions that you want to email me, teachers, uh, feel free to email me and I'll get you the answers um, as best as possible. For those of you that can stay on the line, we're really lucky to have some more time with Doug Ming. And Doug, I do have a couple of additional questions. Here is one actually from, let's see, this, this one, where did my question go? Um, from Bednarsik Junior High, actually, this ah, from Lincoln Avenue School. Now, Doug, I, I, this might be a loaded question, but Lincoln Avenue School from New Jersey, as well as Wataga Middle School here in Texas, they're curious about how, how does the politics work? Like what nation would Mars be under if, if that even makes any sense? Yeah, uh, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, that question is one that is talked about and has been debated for years. Uh, we actually have uh, what is called uh, space policy. Uh, there are folks uh, at universities and within NASA and within all of the spacefaring nations that have sat down and talked about this. I'm not an expert in it, so I can't go into the details, uh, but there are definitely laws that are in place about who owns what when they go somewhere. Um, so those aren't uh, what I would say uh, written down somewhere where you can just go find that, but uh, the nations do talk about this. 
I do anticipate that uh, the first uh, uh, Mars landing uh, mission will be of international nature. Uh, it's really tough for one nation to go alone uh, because of the finances. Uh, so I would in, uh, anticipate that uh, all of the spacefaring nations that could uh, participate and contribute will do that. Uh, we get there and we set uh, down a flag. Uh, I hope it's a flag for planet Earth. Excellent. I totally agree. Here, here. Here's a question from Parkview, and this is an interesting question. They want to know, and Parkview is actually a group that we have out of Illinois, and they're wondering, so what part of Mars does NASA want to go to with humans, I'm assuming? <laughs> Great question. Okay, so uh, next week uh, here at the Johnson Space Center, we actually will hold it uh, at our one of our satellite research areas over here called the Lunar and Planetary Institute, uh, there are scientists and engineers from all over the world coming here to discuss that exact topic. Where do we go on Mars uh, for our first human landed mission? And uh, you can actually go online, uh, and I think the abstracts for that are currently online, so you can actually start to see uh, the 50 so places that are being suggested that we land. Some of those include good old where we are now with Curiosity, Gale Crater. Uh, there are scientists and engineers that say we need to go back to uh, Gusev Crater where Spirit landed. Uh, there are some that say we need to go to the bottom of that monstrous uh, valley on Mars, Mars called Valley Marineris. Uh, so there are a lot of different sites that are being suggested. Now, what are the criteria? Well, science is definitely a driver. Uh, we want to go somewhere where we can uh, learn something uh, new about Mars and try to understand uh, what happened to the planet over its uh, geologic time. Safety. We've got to land somewhere safe. We've got to make sure that there's not uh, dangerous terrain that uh, during landing or maybe we can't even rove around this area. So uh, safety will definitely make a uh, player in that. And the other one we've been talking about a lot, resources. What resources will we need in order to sustain potentially the first Outpost on the planet or long-term uh, colonization uh, of the planet. And is that a pretty, in deciding of a landing site, is that a pretty um, uh, vigorous debate that occurs between those that are involved in that discussion? Yeah, it, it, it's, I, would, I don't know if it's a vigorous debate. It's a debate. It's a scientific engineering debate. Uh, where do we go? Uh, not everybody's going to agree. Uh, that's what us scientists and engineers do best is we don't always agree on everything. So there will be uh, discussions on uh, uh, where to go. And probably what will happen is that the folks that are all involved in the, de the design, the nations that are involved in this will all have a say in it on where we end up actually going to that first landing site on Mars. Well, it sure will be exciting. Now, Mernon Elementary is a group from uh, San Antonio, Texas. And speaking of humans and going to Mars, they're thinking about the spacesuits that are being developed. And can you say anything about what those spacesuits are being made out of? Others mentioned, you know, how they look bulky and yeah. move around in. Any thoughts on the spacesuits? Yeah, so, uh, boy, at one time I used to work with the folks that uh, developed the spacesuits for uh, space station. And uh, they had a special cloth they made. I can't remember the exact components. I know they called it a beta cloth. Uh, but uh, these materials are tear resistant, they're are atmospherically uh, sealed, so they don't lose atmosphere. Uh, they're you know, insulated as well, so those are the things you have to uh, take into consideration on the suits. But right off the top of my head, I can't remember the uh, exact composition, some kind of, uh, I think it was some kind of a polymer-based material. Awesome, and they do continue to test them, and they even have people from our facilities that work to test some of those spacesuits to see how nimble they could potentially be uh, walking around perhaps on another planet. So right. interesting stuff. Uh, here's a question coming from Harmony Hills. They're wondering how, do, how will NASA choose the people to live on and, li and work on Mars? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Uh, uh, so do you send the first uh, four that go to Mars, do you send four males, do you send four females? Do you send two males, do you send two females? That's the first question you've got to ask. Then you've got to ask the question, 
what are the uh, the uh, skills of each of these folks? Uh, I know I'd want to. Somebody was a darn good engineer to go with me uh, that could fix just about anything. Uh, those of you seen The Martian, you know that's what uh, uh, Mark uh, Watney is. He's the he's uh, the fix it guy. He's the engineer. He can do anything. I uh, definitely would like to have somebody like that on there. Uh, we've talked about medicine issues. Uh, somebody that knows something about uh, uh, medical procedures. Somebody could, could do something if they had to uh, on on Mars. Uh, hey, if we're going to grow plants, got to have a botanist. Now, uh, uh, our, the Martian doubled as a botanist and a uh, engineer, so he had both of those skills. So that, it's going to take folks that are. Uh, multi-talented, uh, and uh, NASA's been debating this. I don't know if they've made a decision yet on exactly what the crew mix will be, uh, but that is definitely something that is under consideration now. Excellent. And, you know, speaking of going to Mars, one of the groups wondered, would you be interested in going to Mars, and would, that, would it be a scary thing for you? Would you be excited to go? What would you do? Yeah, so uh, I've always wanted to go into uh, I unfortunately have bad eyes, so the, the, the astronaut corps would not accept me. Uh, but if I had the opportunity to go to Mars, and I could do it safely, I would not want to do anything where it would be dangerous. Uh, of course, going in space is dangerous, just don't, don't get me wrong. But as safely as we possibly could, uh, I, would, I would probably jump at the opportunity to do it. Now, the only issue is now is I'm getting old. Uh, back when I was a wee pup uh, 20, 30 years ago, and, and maybe as young as even some of you folks uh, are now, uh, I wouldn't have hesitated. I would have gone into space in a second. And uh, uh, going to Mars has been a lifelong dream that I would love to do. I, I actually would, was uh, working on uh, uh, moon base my very first uh, uh, years, my, my early years here at uh, NASA, and uh, would definitely do that. That's a short trip. Uh, the, the going to Mars is a huge commitment. Uh, you're looking at about uh, 500 days, probably, uh, transit on the surface and back. And that's about the shortest amount of time you'd have to do it. Uh, but if I had the opportunity, I'd do it. Awesome. And uh, somewhat related to that, let's see, where was that question that I was going to ask? Oh, a group had actually asked, I know you mentioned your family, your teachers were important in your, in your journey to NASA, but what actually inspired you to act to be interested in space and geology and the planets and things such as that? Yeah, I, I, like I say, uh, uh, my career and uh, path of getting here is a little bit by luck. Uh, I was uh, born a lot many, many years ago, so I was around uh, for the very first launches of humans into space. And uh, when those folks went into space, I was just awestruck. These guys are going into orbit. Uh, and then uh, I lived through the Apollo uh, missions and watching, I, I was glued to the radio mainly because we didn't have very good TV back in those days. Uh, listening to the, the conversations between uh, the folks here at Johnson Space Center, Mission Control, and those astronauts on the surface. Uh, when uh, Armstrong and Aldrin were on the surface uh, doing their first steps, historic steps out there, that was just incredible. Uh, so anyhow, uh, that has that always been really inspirational for me. Uh, and then one day uh, when I was getting my doctor's degree, I met a couple guys from NASA, and they wanted to know, could we grow plants on Earth? And that's what really did drive me uh, towards this area. Get, that really was one of those lucky things I was talking about, in the right place at the right time. Uh, and that's what drove me uh, to come to do uh, research here at the Johnson Space Center. Awesome. And we're sure glad that Doug's here at NASA Astro Materials Research and Exploration Science. Uh, he is such a great, great asset, and especially also for the Mars rovers. And maybe even for teachers and some suggestions, because Doug, here's a question. A teacher wants to know, do you have any suggestions for labs that we can do in the classroom to better understand plant growth in soil from Mars? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Uh, the best thing that I could recommend, uh, the closest 
uh, material that you can get uh, that would be Mars-like is if you go to a garden store and you get some uh, volcanic rock, uh, hummus, uh, materials, uh, the only problem is it's usually rock, and you have to have it ground up or somehow you could crush it without breathing the dust and without putting shrapnel in your eye. But if you can get that ground up to where it's uh, soil-like, uh, that would be probably the best material to start off with with growing plants in it because uh, uh, Mars is compo composed almost entirely of, of, uh, of uh, volcanic rock. Uh, so that would be the first start. And then uh, my recommendation would be uh, we know that volcanic rock is pretty fertile except that it doesn't have uh, hardly any nitrogen, so you're going to have to add some fertilizer. Uh, so you could actually add a little bit of nitrogen fertilizer, and you could do different trials, uh, different amounts of nitrogen, per se, uh, and do this. Uh, you could use uh, natural sunlight, or you could set up an a internal uh, uh, light bed uh, where you actually uh, put something in, in, in uh, maybe a combination of uh, light-emitting diodes, uh, the two lights that are most important for uh, wavelengths that are most important for plants are red and blue. Uh, we grow uh, plants on the space station right now. Uh, in fact, if some of you may have seen the recent uh, growth of uh, lettuce in what's called the veggie. And in the veggie, uh, there are two lights that are used to supply uh, the light wavelengths for those plants, and it's red and blue. And so you could set up banks of red and blue lights that might be used internally to uh, habitat. So there's a lot of different things you can do uh, with respect to this. Uh, if you can't get volcanic rock, then uh, perhaps just getting uh, uh, some uh, variety of sand, uh, maybe a little uh, vermiculite, maybe some uh, uh, of the uh, perlite materials and mix that together. Because that's not really very productive per se, because uh, it doesn't have things like nitrogen in it, that would kind of simulate what Mars uh, soil might be like. Awesome. Sounds like there should be there could be some good science projects going on out there. Yeah, absolutely. And here's the very last question we'll ask you, Doug, for especially for those students that are on the line. Do you have any recommendations of what does a student do if they would like to somehow get involved in NASA as part of their future career? Any recommendations from you? Yeah, uh, stay in school, uh, uh, do well, uh, go to college. And uh, as far as uh, things you can do uh, for your long-term career, those are the most important. Uh, now, there are programs uh, that you can get involved with NASA, and Paige will more than likely have a number of different things that she can provide you with that you can get involved in. Uh, like, for example, Paige, uh, uh, the Mars Involvement Program, uh, those kinds of things. So there, there are various things that you can get involved in, and Paige knows a lot more about that than I do. And being involved is really key. Don't close the door on things you think, ah, oh, that doesn't sound too interesting. Test things, see if something is of interest to you. As Doug showed in one of his slides, NASA just isn't about astronauts. It's about scientists, engineers, historians, educators, reporters, lawyers, you name it, artists, computer science folks. Would you say, Doug, having a passion for what you're going to pursue is probably one of the really key points in, in, along with that education? Absolutely. It, it has to be part of it. It has to be. And Doug is really such a passionate individual. You can probably have, hear it in his voice, hear it in, in his presentation. And thank you, Doug, for sharing not just your little bit of advice you gave here at the very end, but all of your knowledge, passion, and information about real Martian explorers and just what does it take. Hopefully for you teachers out there and you students that are on the line, we sure hope that you got a lot out of this webinar conference. As it is 15 minutes past the top of the hour, I want to just take this moment to say thank you again, Doug, on behalf of all of the students and teachers that were on the line. Thank you so much for your great presentation. And you students on the line and teachers, thank you for joining us today. Any last comments, Doug? Yeah, I just want to thank uh, all the, the students out there and their teachers for joining us today. It's, it's a lot of fun. 
uh, having this opportunity to talk to you all because you are the future. You are the ones that's going to pick up my torch, and uh, I've got a few years left here at NASA and carry it on. So I'm dependent upon you to get us to Mars. Awesome. So we need someone to sit there in Doug's chair. So uh, <laughs> really to be one of you. Yeah. Great. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thanks so much for joining us again. Uh, at this point, we'll officially sign off. And teachers, I will send you some information, an archive link, and thank you again for joining us. Take care, everyone. Have a great day, and we look forward to seeing you someday working here at NASA. Bye-bye, everyone.